I've got some quick club announcements and then I'm going to turn it over to our uh, guest tonight. <clears throat> um, first, I want to mention that if any volunteers have or, or anybody's interested in volunteering some time to help Lisa go through uh, some donations she has, she's got a bunch of stuff stored in her garage and she um, wants to get some photos and, and, and make sure that all our uh, promotional items are accounted for and that kind of thing. So please reach out to her. Uh, I think Sonia, you had, had decided or, or going to connect idea. with her on that. Thank you very much yeah. for doing that. But I think uh, she could probably use more help as well, or you guys could use more help. So I'll reach help out. Sonia and Lisa out, please. Um, <laughs> I'll reach out to her. Okay, great. Um, also wanted to mention that the volunteers who didn't get club T-shirts at Reef Palooza. Those additional shirts just came in, and Lisa will be reaching out um, on that. Uh, photo of the month winners for last month. Trawler uh, was a winner. He gets a $50 gift certificate. I'm not exactly sure to what because it's not in my information, but he's got a $50 gift certificate. Um, Awesome. NT, NTL555, I, I don't know who that is, but that's their screen name, uh, won some Reef Nutrition Pack Pods. And then Craig won uh, some Reef Nutrition Arctic Pods. So uh, Lisa will be reaching out on that as well. Congratulations to the Photos of the Month winner. Um, the next photo of the month is open, so please get your photos submitted and, and vote. Um, upcoming events, the next hobbyist hangout will be Saturday, February 10th at the School of Fish in DeSoto, including, you know, lots of free stuff. Um, please come join us. The 2024 Frag Swap will be March 9. So keep that date open. A few tables are still available. Details are available on the website. Uh, and this club event is being promoted by Reef Hobbyist Magazine. It's always one of our signature events. So please circle March 9 on your calendar. Um, please stick around for the end of the presentation because we have lots of stuff to give away, but you have to be present to win. Uh, and now I'm going to... Uh, turn it over to uh, Mac. <clears throat> Jason Mac is his name, but I believe people call you Mac, right, Mac? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mac has is a uh, uh, marine aquarist and reef aquarist. I believe you're in the Netherlands, correct? Yep, that's true. Yep. And he has kindly um, stayed up or gotten up at two in the morning over there to be able to talk to us to, uh, tonight. So we really, really appreciate it, Mac. Thank you so much. No problem. Murray, if I start to fall asleep, just shout at me. <laughs> I, I will. I will. I'll go, Dinos! <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, uh, Mac is going to talk about, uh, you know, he's how long have you been in the hobby, Mac? How many years? Uh, 10 years. He's been in the hobby 10 years um, and uh, was active in, in some other social media platforms or sites that were dealing with these reoccurring neonflagellate issues that seem to be popping up now in tanks where it wasn't as much of an issue maybe 10, 15 years ago. So um, this has been a real focus of the hobby over the last year. I think more and more, at least anecdotally, it seems to me, more and more people are dealing with dinoflagellate issues. And so um, uh, Mac has a Facebook group and uh, I'll let you, you know, more describe that in more detail, uh, Mac, but this Facebook, book, uh, Facebook group has become one of the major online resources for this problem. So, um, you know, Mac's gonna talk about identification. Um, he's gonna talk about treatments. He's gonna talk about potential causes. Um, and where we go forward from here. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mac. Thanks for being with us. No, thanks uh, for having me. Thanks for the invite. Uh, it was uh, great to meet Lisa at uh, Dallas at RAP when I was there. 
when she initially invited me to come on. Um, like you said, I've been in the hobby 10 years. I've been dealing with Dinos probably, I got my first round of Dinos about eight years ago. And uh, it was a nightmare. And I didn't know what to do. And I was looking on all different reforms and forums and everything, trying to find the information on how to deal with them. And there wasn't that much information. Or there was also a lot of misinformation. So I used to pull my hair out at it and my tank was so bad that I would literally come down in the morning and I'd be like, I'd walk past it like this and I just couldn't look at it. And I'd sit in, I'd almost cry at it actually as well. <laughs> but anyway, it goes on and uh, I started reading up about it. I was on the reef to reef and uh, I started learning there about the different types and how to, uh, how to identify them and the best treatments for them. So uh, one of the treatments for uh, Osteopsis, which is the most toxic of all the Dinos, and it's the most ugly of all the Dinos, but luckily it's the easiest one to treat once you know how to treat it. And the problem is, is you need an oversized UV. And eight years ago when I had mine, I didn't know this, and I actually went through three different types of UVs trying to get to the right size. And uh, anyway, I, I beat them and um, then I got it again uh, a few months later and I ended up with two types in the tank this time. So I got the Osteopsis back and then I ended up with, I think it was a Prorocentrum. So again, I have to delve into it again and find out how to deal with the Prorocentrum. And I did that. And then uh, after I dealt with him, then I started helping people in my, in my local area friends who had tanks over here who were dealing with it and and on some of the reefing groups that we have over here in Holland I was helping people and basically it's developed from there and now I'm eight eight years further uh three years ago I think three and a half years ago I started the group and uh the reason I started the group was uh, I thought I thought to myself I want there to be one place where people can come to, where the information is available, where they can get the right information, and we can try and dispel some of the misinformation around the Dinos. Now, the group now has, I think, almost 13,600 members worldwide. And that's over three and a half years. And we get roughly, I would say, 80 to 70 to 100 members a week joining. So you can imagine the type of problem this is in the world. It's massive. Yeah. Could you tell people exactly the name of your Facebook group so people could find it? It's a Max Reef Dino Flagets Support Group. I don't, I don't know if you can see the banner behind me. Great. Well, I think we have that also information posted on the uh, forums as well. So if people want to access it there. Um, before you kind of get into the nuts and bolts, Mac, why don't you kind of explain um, what a, you know, dinoflagellates specifically are and why they're so dangerous? Well, I wouldn't say they're dangerous, but they're a single cell flagellate. They're the second most abundant source in the oceans next to diatoms. They are basically, they are part of the ecosystem. There's probably in nature, something like 1500, 1500 different types of dinoflagets. Marine velvet is uh, from the family of dinoflagets. And uh, zoanthalia inside the corals is also from the family of dinoflagets. Now, basically, what we see in our reef tanks is five types. The rest, a lot of them are freshwater uh, dinos as well, but obviously we don't see them. So the five different types are Osteopsis, Coolia, Prorocentrum, large cell amphidiniums, and small cell amphidiniums. Now in nature, I think there's like 10 different types of Osteopsis. And... Uh, 
I can't say for sure, but maybe we see a couple of types in our tanks from the Osteopsis. We've also started seeing uh, two types of prorocentrum, and we see this on the shape of them. Uh, normally, they're sort of uh, like oval, oblong shape, but now we see them as being like misformed. Now, we call them misformed, but I think it's just another form of, of, of dinos that we're seeing. Now, we can't say, I can't say for sure why we're seeing them the way we see them now, apart from the fact that if you look back 10 or 15, 20 years ago, when everybody was running metal holidays and T5s, everybody was using the proper live rock that we used to get from the sea. And um, uh, what else? Yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, and now we now we see, we're not getting we don't get the abundance of live rock that we have. Everybody starts the tanks with dry rock, and everybody's the, the macro rocks. I think we run the tanks too clean. And I think also one of my theories is that with the advancement of LED lights in the hobby, that whether there's a wavelength or a spectrum in the LED lights that is feeding the dinos. Because like I said, 10, 15 years ago, everybody's running ultra low nutrient systems, zero phosphates, zero uh, nitrates, and none dinos were unheard of. And now with the advancement of everything, now we see them coming out more and more and more. And it's such a peripheral, Afflicts affliction in the hobby. So why do we get them? Yeah, that's hard to say. We see them in new tanks. We see them in old tanks. We see them in tanks with zero nutrients. We see them in tanks with high nutrients. Is it a lack of biodiversity in the tank? Are we running the tanks too clean? Is it a combination of the lights and the lack of, uh, like I say, the lack of biodiversity and the lack of live rock. It's hard to say. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a, a normal hobbyist like, like everybody. And th the things I've learned and the methods that I've learned over the years is uh, it's come from experience from myself and experience from others. I don't know if you can see. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. These are coolier. Okay. Now these are almost perfectly round and they're very dark in color and they're found mainly on the sunbed. Now these we uh, are treated with UV. And we have Osteopsis. These are almond shaped and they have a little point on the end, a little white tip on the end. These okay. are the the most common that we see in the tanks and these spin around their axis and they in the tank they form long strings and they're, they're found everywhere all over the tank on your equipment on your glass on your rocks on your corals everywhere and they're really snotty strings that form from it and the strings that we see is only the mucus that the dinos are producing that's why the, the osteopsis are probably the most ugly from all the dinos. And they're, they're also typically uh, indicated by a lot of bubbles in that formation. They'll trap gas. Their mucus will trap gas, right? Yeah, that's true. But, I mean, bubbles in an aquarium is just gas exchange, and it's not only found with dinos, which is also a misconception. If you have algae, Normal algae will also produce bubbles because there's always going to be some sort of interaction and a gas exchange from them. I can't believe I can't share this thing. Anyway, um, so when dealing with dinos, uh, the best method is first you're going to need to ID the dinos. So we're going to need a microscope. Now, the microscopes that we recommend is uh, an AMSCOPE. M150C, and normally you can buy it on Amazon. It's like 60, 50, 60, 70 dollars. And it's a, a standard microscope 
uh, uh, you can get them with uh, the double eyepiece or the single eyepiece. And then, then we can identify the denos. And the best magnification is 400 times. So on the group, this is one of the first things we advise. You need to know what you're dealing with before we can give you a treatment for it. So that's going to be one of the, the first things that you're going to need to do when you, when you think you have denos, is find out which type you have. One of the things also you're going to need to do is look at your nutrients. Now, like I said, we see tanks with high nutrients and low nutrients with denos in them. Most of the time, is they're going to be zero nutrients. Now, whether the denos, because denos also can eat uh, and, and use nutrients. So whether they're using it up themselves first and that it's being depleted, but there's they're such a, a, how do you say that? They're able to survive without nutrients because they can also survive from photosynthesis. So once you take the nutrients out, then all the other algae and all the other things that need your nutrients in the tank that are going to outcompete the dinos, they can't survive where the dinos can. And the dinos can reproduce so fast. This is why you hear people say, oh, I cleaned the tank, I siphoned it out, and a couple of hours later, they're back again. But you're not really siphoning them out. You're siphoning the mucus out that they produce. The dinos are so small that you don't, you know, you're not going to get them. So first you're going to want to microscope them. Then you're going to want to ad address the, your nutrients. So you want to raise your nutrients up. Now, what is best for the nutrients is one up a hundred, which is what we recommend. So for every one PPM nitrate, NO3, equals 0 0.01 PPM PO4, phosphates. This is, uh, like I say, it's one up 100. And then we, rec we recommend to aim between 5 and 10 for your nitrates and between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 for your phosphates. This is balanced. And then uh, after that, you're going to want to dose things like phytoplankton and copepods. Phytoplankton is uh, the start of the food chain in the ocean. This is a really important for your micro, uh, the microorganisms and everything in your tank. They need this to, to survive and it's going to feed them. It's going to help with the biodiversity in your tank. So we, what you want to try and do is create a stable conditions for other things in the tank to survive and outcompete the dinos. Adding the copepods is going to help. The phytoplankton is going to help. Raising your nutrients is going to help. Now with Osteopsis and Coolia, these are the ones that are going to be treated with a UV. And we recommend an oversized UV. So... What we recommend is one watt per three gallons on a tank. So if your tank is, what is it, uh, uh, whatever, if you work it out, you get an oversized UV, and the UV needs to be set up so that it's pulling and returning from out of your display tank, so not in the sun. And this is temporary, because with the UV, Osteopsis will clear up within seven days. Normally, within three days, it will clear a tank of them. And then we recommend you run it for another two weeks because you have uh, some dinos can cyst and go into a resting cyst form. And basically, in the ocean, they can go into a resting cyst form for decades. That means they'll rest and they'll wait for the conditions to be right before they come back out again. And this is why we don't recommend doing blackouts on tanks. Because when you do a blackout on a tank, for three, everyone says, do a blackout, cover your tank up for three days, and then uh, and run the UV. But it's going to force the dinos into the resting cyst forms. So the moment that you take the, the light, the, the, the covers off the tank, and you put the light back in the tank, the dinos are going to come back again.
And this we see nine out of 10 times. I can't say that people haven't had success like this. They have. But the other thing with this is that not a lot of people talk about this is trace elements on a tank. If your trace elements aren't in line, your corals, especially with SPS corals, they, will, they won't be able to, produce, uh, to process the toxins from the dinos. And if they can't process the toxins, then they're going to be affected and you're going to end up with STN and RTN and your corals are going to die. This is why a lot of people, when they do blackouts, they come out of it and they say, oh, but I lost a load of corals from it. Yeah, because your trace elements are off. If your trace elements aren't good, then it's going it, to affect your, your tank in a bad way. So blackouts is something that we don't recommend at all. Uh, trace elements is another important factor when dealing with dinos. There's certain trace elements that when in balance in a tank will inhibit the growth of fast growing algae. So that's hair algae, cyano, dinos, this sort of thing. So what you're looking for is your iodine, your fluoride, your vanadium, uh, uh, Boron, barium, nickel, zinc, and the main ones. The, uh, on the group, we advise people to do an ICP test and to look and correct their trace elements. And when they post their results on the group, most of the time, these are the elements that we see that are out of balance on tanks with dinos. So correcting these elements and getting them back in line is also going to help. Uh, it's going to help uh, get rid of the dinos because it's going to inhibit the growth of the dinos as well. So, okay, we have five types of dinos. Like I said, you have Osteopsis and Coolia. These two are predominantly we, we treat with the UV. Then you have Prorocentrum, large cell and small cell amphidiniums. And these we treat with uh, dosing water glass or liquid sodium silicates, which creates a diatom bloom. And the diatoms outcompete the dinos. Uh, water glass is mainly used, it's got a lot of uses really, but I mean, it's used in construction for sealing concrete, it's used in pottery. Uh, they use it for things like uh, old water pipes that they, uh, uh, to stop the water, old water pipes from decaying. It's used for preserving eggs. It's used for, for preserving wood, but it's also used for culturing diatoms, which is the application that we apply to it. Now, water glass is 40%. It's, it ranges between 36 and 42%. So we recommend if you have, uh, Prorocentrum or the large cell or the small cell amphidiniums, then again, you're going to be looking at your nutrients levels, getting your nutrients up, dosing live phytoplankton and copepods, and you're dosing the silicates. Uh, but water glass is very thick. It's like a syrup. And you only need a very, very small amount of it. So the recommended dose is 0 0.2 mil per 15 gallons. And that will give you two ppm of silicates, SE, in your tank. And we recommend holding it between two and three ppm. You can go more. It's not a problem. There's no, relief, no ill effects on a tank when you overdose silicates. But it, having more is not going to give you more diatoms. This is what we found. But saying that, uh, well, we had a guy on the group and he, for some reason or other, he, I don't know if it was because he was working away or whatever, but he decided to put his silicates on a doser. And when he came back and he did an ICP test, his silicate level was 243 ppm on a mixed reef tank with SPS without any ill effect on the tank at all, to the corals, to the inverts, or to the fish. So dosing silicates is a very safe way 
of outpopulating the dinos. Uh, so this is the treatment that we recommend for the other three. Uh, what, uh, what more can I say? Uh, yeah, dosing silicates is not a fast uh, solution. It's not going to be in... Hey, that's a handsome guy there. Who's that? That's not gonna, it's not going to be a fast solution to it. It can take anything from two weeks to six months. It all depends on your tank. Silica is taken up really fast in a reef tank. Normally, what you put in today is gone tomorrow, which is why we recommend doing it every day. So you work out your dose for your tank. Normally, depending on the size of your tank, but you're going to be dosing anything from, if you, if you have like a, uh, say, a 15-gallon nano tank, then you're going to only be dosing 2.0.2 mil per day. If you have a, a larger tank, uh, say, 165-gallon tank, then you're going to be looking at dosing something like two mil per day. Now, the dose needs to be mixed in ROD water. If it's not mixed in ROD water and you just put it straight into the tank, it crystallizes and it ends up like a snow effect in the tank. And then it just takes a lot longer for it to break down and be used up. But when you mix it in ROD water, then it stops it from crystallizing. And then you add it to your tank. And you'll get like a, you, you add it to it in front of a wave maker and you get like a clouding effect and it just dissipates straight away, basically. And then you need to do this every day. And like I say, you're aiming for two to three PPM. Now, what we recommend is, is that you do this for a couple of weeks and then you send off an ICP test. So because mostly the hobby grade test kits that we have for silicates aren't accurate. It's always hit and miss. One of the best ones we've, that I've found is over here is from Colombo. But obviously, you, can't, you guys can't get that in America. That's only available over here. But that's probably one of the most reliable ones. The, the rest, uh, yeah, like I say, it's all hit and miss. So doing the ICP test, you'll get an accurate readout of what your silica is. And you'll get a readout of what your trace elements are. So then correcting your trace elements, combination of the diatoms, correcting your trace elements, dosing every day, and slowly you, you get a diatom bloom. The diatoms are going to outcompete the dinos. And what you see basically is that the, your tank's going to get dirty. It's going to look a mess. It's going to get worse before it gets better because you're creating a diatom bloom as well. So it, it's adding to it. And we recommend that you don't clean the tank. You let the tank get nice and dirty. You can clean the glass or whatever, but the rest of it, don't siphon it out. Don't clean anything. Just leave it. You want, you want to give the chance for the other organisms, the other algaes to take hold and, and help you outcompete dinos. Cyano will outcompete dinos as well. And normally after you're dosing silicates, basically it's like kickstarting the cycle again. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so like when you start a tank up, you're going to get your diatoms and you, you start getting your hair algae, you start getting your cyano. It all goes through this uh, the initialization of the nitrogen uh, thing. and So you get this. And it, uh, the other algae are going to come, they're going to outcompete everything. And then after a few weeks or whatever, you, you, with regular monitoring using your microscope, you can see the stand versus the dinos and the diatoms. So when you can only find one or two uh, dinos per sample slide, then we say, okay, now you can stop dosing silicates. And then people will say, okay, they'll come back and they'll say, okay, the dinos are gone, but now I've got diatoms everywhere. How do I get rid of the diatoms? Do I siphon them out? Do I use a silicate remover? And the best thing is just to leave it. Like I say, silicate is taken up fast in a reef tank. So... If you go in there and you clean it and you pull everything out, all the silicates out, all the diatoms out, then you're just opening up the playing field again for the dinos to come back. In a reef tank, nothing good happens fast. So everything we do 
is done slowly. Let everything, let the silicates dissip, uh, dissipate. The diatoms, once the silicate is used up, the diatoms are going to start disappearing. And it's going to give the time for the other organisms and the other biodiversity in the tank to take a hold. You've got your nutrients up, you're feeding everything again, and you're getting stability back into your tank. And then once the diatoms are gone and your dinos are gone, hey, presto, you have white sand again. Your tank is going to look great. Your corals are going to benefit also from the, from the silicates because they use that as well. So that's, I, basically that's it. That's how we deal with the dinos. So Mac, what's the, what's the, the biggest problem you see in your Facebook group that, that keeps on coming up and up again when people are dealing with dinos? I think that would be low nutrients. People struggle so much with keeping their nutrients up. That's that's a really big problem, which is why we recommend dosing them. You can, I mean, you can take your skimmer offline, you can start overfeeding, but it can take time, and it's very uncontrolled, and it's hard to, uh, yeah, it's hard to to get to the levels where they're going to be balanced. So what we what we recommend is just dosing them. Use something like Brightwell's Neofos or Neo Nitro or, or whatever is available to where you are. Obviously, we don't. I don't have that over here because uh, we don't get much Brightwell's things over here. Actually, Brightwell's is now a sponsor on the group as well. Oh, that's great! And and you're doing a collaboration with Hannah on their phosphate checkers, aren't you? Yeah, that was another thing that we we also. I wouldn't say discovered, but we found the HANA previously said that the phosphate checkers only registered silicates when it's above 10 ppm. And we find that not to be true. It's, it's at low levels as well. So probably from around what we think is probably 1 ppm, that the HANA FOS, uh, FOS checker is uh, going to start registering the, the silicates in the water as well, and you get a false high reading. So what happens is, or what happened was, this is how it came about, was that people were dosing the silicates, and they were testing the, the, their FOS, and they were saying, oh, my FOS is up, it's reading uh, 0 0.2. So then they were going back in, and they were trying to reduce it again. But it was a false high. So they were, in effect, compounding the... The problem, because they were reducing it back down to nil again, almost, or very, very low levels without actually knowing about it. So we, what we recommend is when you're dosing silicates, is that you use just a normal uh, a normal phosphate test from Red Sea or Sally Furtz or something like this, because with the colour dilation uh, test, because these don't seem to be affected by it. It's only the HANA. And uh, I think it was a couple of days ago, uh, Hannah Instruments uh, USA, they joined the group. I've uh, been talking to them. Uh, and now we're working with them to try and solve the problem, to see if they can fix the, uh, the problem of the, the reading high fault, uh, reading it high. Because like I said, they said it was at 10 ppm. And that is obviously, it's not the case. So that's that's something I'm really really pleased about that's happened real recently. Yeah, well, kudos for them to you know engage with their with the hobby you know on the hobbyist level and and really work work to try and develop a product that that's useful for us. Well, we have also found and Marin is also uh, on the group. This is also a sponsor from the group. The owner uh, Cloud Schumacher is a very good friend of mine. Uh, I, I know him personally, which is a big bonus for me. And he helps us also with reading the ICP tests and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, that's also a, a good thing. I think over the last, you know, we're getting more recognized and we're talking with some of the biggest companies that are in the, in the, in the hobby and they're getting really interested in helping us. Brightwells are really interested in helping us. Uh, I can't say much, but I'm, we're working on a couple of things at the moment that, uh, well, 
we have to see what's going to happen. But uh, yeah, Jack's a really nice guy. He's really down to earth, and he's really keen uh, to to help us. So it's good. I'm really pleased about it. Yeah, that's that's pretty good to know because I use the uh, handed phosphate checker. And well, I if you're not dosing silicates, it's not a problem. Okay, good. And another problem that's come up on the group as well with the HANA checkers is that a couple of people have said that the 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 line for the 10 mil on the bottom on the on the vials is wrong. It's not 10 mil. Nope. It's less. Yep. They've, use, uh, I've, I've noticed it. that as well. Yeah. I, uh, 10 milliliter uh, syringe, uh, medical syringe. Yeah, precisely. I know exactly. It's it's spot on. And I noticed that my water line is above that white line. And I, I contacted them and, and questioned them about it. And they said, oh, no, everything's fine. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, okay. So, so no, fill the also, white line. So it's really not 10 milliliters. Right. It's whatever no. that white line is. Yeah, because well, they're, we have, they're we have producing a such mass volumes. Yeah. We have a couple of guys on the group that actually weigh the way out the 10 mil. And wow. they've said the same thing. And now this has also been brought to the attention of Hannah. So hopefully they're going to address this issue as well. Yeah. Yep. I I have to say something about Hannah instrument. Uh phosphate and nitrate. I do ICP monthly, and actually my readings are really spot on with Hannah. But I don't do silicate anymore, yeah. thanks to Jason. <laughs> Alicia, hi. <laughs> hi, guys. I'm Alisa. I'm from Idaho. Um, I'm part of quite a few clubs. I, I just heard about your club, thanks to Jason, and I figured I'd join you guys. Awesome. I love the hobby. I've been in the hobby for three years, not very long time, but yeah. Well, well, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate yes, it. Alicia, are there any, very, any questions? Very, Alicia has a very, very beautiful tank. Thank it's you. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a hot um, man. That's what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody uh, have any questions for Mac? No, is that it? Can I go to bed now? <laughs> I can imagine, Mac. No, I'm all right. It's not a problem. Well, I'm not seeing any in the chat, but um, again, you know, access to the information about his Facebook page is um, on the uh, website, on the forums, um, under events. So uh, encourage everybody to, to join that Facebook group and have that as a, as a, a resource, a, a really a, a crowdsourced resource um, to a, a prevalent pro uh, issue in the hobby. If you hadn't run across this problem yet, uh, you may very well in the future. So uh, Mac, thank you so much for being here and we're not running you off. We've, we've got some other stuff to do, but please stick around and, uh, you know, I'm happy to, to leave the, the Zoom meeting going for additional questions or, or general discussion. I'll, I'll stick around for a bit, no problem. <clears throat> I've got some more tea with me, so uh... there you go. Load up on caffeine. <laughs> so, you know, you guys are going to have to excuse me on this, but I, I'm just going to sort of go through the gifts and, and randomly throw them out there to people. <laughs> There's really, I, I don't know any other way to do it. I think Lisa usually uses a hat, but you know, this is the way we're going to do it tonight. Um, it's your show, man, run it. Oh yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> I'm glad you stepped up because, man, I had no clue as to what this this pertained to. Right. Well, so the first thing we need to give away tonight um, are two um, reef nutrition pack pods. So I believe that's one of each of the Arctic pod and the other, right? I think. Uh, anyway, we have two of those. We're giving those away. Um, and the first winner is uh, Robin. Robin, 
Um, you've won a, a pack pod. Please send an email uh, to Lisa, and her email is secretary at dfwmass.org. Um, and in the email, include your address, and she will send them to you. But she needs to connect with you because these have to be shipped with ice. So, uh, Robin, thank you. Next, Ed, you're getting one too, buddy. So, Ed, please call or email secretary at uh, dfwmass.org with your um, uh, address <laughs> and uh, you, you'll win it. Okay, who else? Man. Karen, congratulations. You won a Reef Lab ICP <laughs> kit. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, so please email uh, <laughs> Lisa at the email address I've described. Get her your address and she'll ship it to you. So Lisa, you're, uh, Karen, you've won a Reef Lab's ICP kit. Perfect for checking your trace nutrients to deal with that Dino problem. <clears throat> Drex, you've won a Reef Labs ICP kit. So congratulations. And please email Lisa with your home address and she'll send it to you. I sure will, man. Appreciate it. Oh, you bet. I think who congratulations. else? Congratulations. Um, Thank you, sir. Nick, Iowa KGB. Um, you've run, you've won a, a set of Red Sea AB plus. Um, so please email Lisa and she'll send it to you. Who am I missing? I got Nick, I got Ed, I got Robin, I got Karen. Oh, Sonia. Oh man. <laughs> Sonia, here's your, here's your choice. You can get a Red, Red Sea AB plus, you can get a Tropic Marin, uh, a Lemmy NP, which is their nitrate phosphate reducing product. Uh, or you can have a, a Tropic Marin plus NP, which is a, um, I think an additive for nutrients like Mac was described. So what you was the first, what was the first, first thing? one was a red C a B plus. I'll go with that. Okay. So, um, when you're over helping Lisa, I'll get it then. <laughs> you, yeah. You just pick it up directly. It'd be great. Mm -hmm. You don't have to give her your address, you know, yep. don't want that information. Look, I know where Lisa lives. I've been over there several times. So no problem. Thank you. I, I think everybody's gotten something. Um, so there we go. All right. I think hook up with hook up Elisa. Yeah, I was gonna say, what about Elisa? Yeah. Oh, Elisa. Man, I forgot. <laughs> Elisa. Forget about her. Um, how about a Tropic Marin eliminate a uh, Lemi NP? They're nitrate and phosphate reducing. They carbon dosing. Sure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Feed those heterotrophic bacteria, man. Get those biofilms up. Um, so if you could email <laughs> secretary at dfwmass.org with your address, she'll send it to you. Thank you. Did so I miss much, anybody? Guys. I don't think so. Said he thinks he won a new car. Was that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put that in the chat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, just send Lisa an email and all your wildest dreams will come true. <laughs> just, just talking about the uh, Red Sea AB Plus. Yeah. Uh, that's aminos. And aminos, if you have dinos, it's not advised to dose anything like that because aminos are going to feed the dinos. Yep. And things like iron as well, when you dose iron, is also going to feed dinos. Hmm. So... I just know. thought I'd mention that quickly because I forgot to mention things like that. Thank you, Jason. These, these things will feed Dinos. Hey. All right. It said Dino's fuel. That's what I call it. Dino juice. No, it's Dino's. <laughs> you know, it was so funny because you keep saying Dino and I, we're used to saying Dino's. Or, dino no, we're used to saying Dino instead of you say Dino. 
You know, yeah. for a long time, I used to think there was two different types of metal. There was aluminium and aluminium. <laughs> <laughs> you Americans, I don't know. Dino Flagellate. Whatever. You know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 That's uh well, you know what? This is a in a very interesting topic, Jason. And I, I really appreciate you doing this for us. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for getting up so late. Yeah. Uh, for staying up for us. Definitely. It's not a problem. If I go to bed now, my girlfriend's just snoring anyway, so I won't sleep. <laughs> Well, I'm going to I'm going to leave the Zoom meeting going because it's not really my meeting. And I think Lisa, when she gets back tonight, is going to, you know, edit it down. So you guys hang out, continue the conversation. Uh, I've got a bolt. But again, Mac, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. And certainly if you're ever over on this side of the pond and in the North Texas area, please let us know. We'd love to uh, uh, hook up with you and show you some hospitality. Oh, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks for the offer. You bet. Good night, everybody. Very nice to meet you. Good night. Good night, guys.